So, um, without further ado, I think we're going to do this without odd mic. But I'd like to introduce uh, Deepak Vakal from Quincy, and he's going to talk a little bit about the uh, application. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Thanks. Woo! Woo! Can everyone hear me? Yeah. I'm a loud voice, so I, I don't actually care so much for the mic. So, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Deepak, and uh, I want to share a few thoughts today about app growth, about mobile growth, right? How do you grow your mobile audience with a specific focus on going beyond just the install of your app to how do you really focus on maximizing transactions within your app? How do you focus on getting people back into your app? So you might ask, like, you know, who's Quixie? So just a quick introduction about the company. Quixie is a mobile search technology company. We've been around for about five years in the Valley. Uh, we're really focused on helping people connect with apps and apps with people. How do we do that? We have something which we call a deep view card, which is a snapshot of the content within an app. And then using deep linking, we connect people to the right content within the app based on a search query you might type in or a contextual query, right? So we power hundreds of millions of searches today for some of our partners, including Alibaba in China, where we're integrated inside their OS, their search engines, their browsers. And there's a number of key learnings we've got by showing results from apps inside these properties that we wanted to share with you, right? And so just a quick show of hands, how many of you are directly involved or in some way or the other with growing your mobile audience and or, or your app? Okay, so it's a fair amount. And the, the rest I'm guessing are like curious to know what is this world about apps and growth? So let's get into it. Uh, so uh, quick thing, so just an agenda, right? I'll talk about app marketing, but how it's rapidly moving from just a good game of installs to focus on engagement. And then what are some of the techniques that app marketers or people involved with apps can use to focus on engagement? Second, you know, we all see ads on mobile because we're all consumers of mobile. But there's also a, 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 what we see, a, a, a trend in the industry of the, seeing the same generic ads over and over again. So how can we change that so that they're much more contextual of the time of the day, the location that you are in, so those ads are much more engaging, much more native, and you want to engage with the apps that you have on your phone. Third, you might ask, you know, if this is kind of the trend, what are some of the ad giants doing about this trend? So we'll show you some examples from Google, from Facebook, from Instagram, or what people are doing to make sure that their ads are a lot more engaging, and also deep linking into apps. Uh, Fourth, we'll talk about some of the more smarter solutions coming out there. And it's not just Quixie, but there are other companies in this deep linking space that are trying to create new types of ad formats to, to engage people back into apps through, through ads. And then fifth, just show you a quick study, case studies around app engagement. So first, just starting with some data, right? Like how big is the app install market? So if you look at eMarketer, it's been growing very rapidly. It was about $3 million in 2015 and is expected to grow again like you know somewhere between five to six billion dollars in 2016. Now we predict that quickly that a lot of these dollars will shift just from pure installs to retention where people will care about how do I not just acquire the user but also retain the user. So how are people finding these apps when through advertising? Some of it happens through search ads whether it's ads on Google, Bing or Yahoo. Social ads, a lot of times people are clicking on Facebook uh, news feeds or Twitter news feeds and installing the app. Um, in app banner ads, so that's programmatic display or just ad networks showing app install ads when you're browsing news or other publishing uh, articles, or just banner ads on websites, right? Or, or video ads. So you see an equal mix of how people are engaging with these different ad formats. Now you might ask the question that, okay, this is the app install market, but why should I worry about app engagement? Here's a simple reason why. 70% of these apps, once they install and use a smartphone, remain dormant. This is a really interesting study from Yahoo that shows that majority of the people will uninstall the app within a week if they're not engaging with it, right? So you think about all these app marketers that are spending six, $10 to install an app, and then the user installs it, doesn't think about it, a week, a month later, they have to clean up their phone, they'll uninstall the app. So you just lost a very valuable user. So then what, you might ask the question, why should I focus on app installs? Why should I focus on paid acquisitions? Uh, here's a simple reason why. Because from a consumer perspective, 90% of the time being spent on mobile is being spent in apps, right? You think about all the major apps, and you compare that to mobile browsers, 
mobile apps wins pretty handsomely, right? And that trend is happening because that's why apps are the lingua franca of mobile, right? And so it's important that you have to be where the user is. The next thing is, you might ask, is are people transacting with apps? Are people buying through apps? So there's again very good data which shows from like Criteo, which shows that you know the uh, conversions within app are two x, right? And especially for like sectors like travel and retail commerce, a lot of purchases happening on mobile, more than half, are happening within apps, right? So if you are making the case that app advertising is important, transactions are happening within apps, right? What is the industry doing about it? Uh, this is where I think that we have to then shift the gears and take a step back and say, we understand the landscape from the app marketer's perspective or the app advertising. What about the consumer journey? And what we are seeing here is that the consumer journey is still not evolving, is that on your mobile phone today, you're seeing a lot of the same generic ads. So we're not making the full utilization of the mobile. The fact that depending on the time of the day, the user is traveling, he's in a certain location, how can you target and show better ads <coughs> that are more contextual to where the user is at? So you think about most of the ads that this user is looking at today, it's the same one which just has a generic message saying, hey, install the Etsy app or install the Amazon app. And what that leads to is even when you look at like social sites like Facebook, Instagram, they're still showing a lot of generic cards or generic ads from all these different uh, uh, app advertisers. So what happens as a result of that, right? It results in lower performance and even lower lifetime value because even when people see these ads, install the apps, they tend to go away, like we saw in that example from the Yam case study, right, where people are uninstalling the apps. So is there a better way of showing more contextually relevant ads? What if, like when you're near the AT&T park or you're a user in San Francisco who's interested in uh, MLB games, then we show you a card which is from your favorite like event app which is showing you a baseball game, depending on your interest, depending on your location, for the SF Giants playing at AT&T Park. Chances are you're more likely to click on that ad and want to transact with it and buy tickets, right? And these are some case studies that we'll show you later on that this is indeed the case. We have recently really some really interesting studies about this. Uh, so the next thing is like, you know, it's more about consumers today expect immediacy and relevance. So when you want to show them an ad, show them an ad that the, based on where they are, based on what their interests are, is showing them something that they care about. So if they, want, if they care about buying, right, they're an avid shopper, then show them something from a commerce app in a want to buy moment. If they're more about going to a sports, if they're a sports enthusiast fan, show them about sporting events. Or if they care about a deal from Groupon, and Groupon is an app that they use frequently, then show them a specific deal local to their area, right? And similarly, if they're like wanting to get somewhere, why not show them a card from Uber at that moment which shows them how far is that average right away, right? So it's a lot more about that kind of in the moment advertising. Uh, so then you might ask, okay, I get it, I get this, but what are some of the ad giants doing about this kind of phenomenon, this trend? So we'll see whether it's Google or Facebook or, or Twitter. Uh, if you look at Google, for example, they've launched these deep linking uh, results inside Google now. They're showing them on their search results, and they're also showing deep linking ads. So if you look at this example about booking.com, you can see the booking.com app showing up as a top result, and when you tap on it, if you have the booking.com app installed, it'll deep link you right into the app, so that you do one more tap, and you're done with the transaction, right? So that's a much more seamless, frictionless way of, of uh, transacting with the hotel that you're looking to book. Uh, similarly, what you're seeing is with Facebook, they will launch these carousel ads or dynamic product ads, which allow you to show a number of different products um, from the Amazon app or from another app. And when you tap on it again, it will deep link you uh, within the app, right? So it's a much more uh, frictionless experience for the user. Uh, so that, this is an example of the Facebook ad. And then one of the most interesting insights we are seeing is the growth of Instagram. Instagram today is at about 400 million users and rapidly growing. And they're making a lot of use of these image-rich uh, carousel ads. And this is a case study which shows that you know, when uh, a, a specific uh, a retailer did this uh, on, on Instagram, they saw an 88% lift in mobile app installs, 30% increase in click-through rates, and 35% increase in the mobile app purchase uh, rate. So it's not about the lift in CTRs or lift in install rates. 
they're actually seeing a higher propensity for people to purchase because of what they're doing and engaging with the content inside the app, right? So that's the really important thing. Compare that to the generic ads that we were seeing at the beginning. This is a lot more engaging, right? Uh, so then you might ask the question that, okay, I see that these ads have a lot more content, but what about the immediacy and the, you know, the, the relevance factors? So this is where Wixie's been working hard for the last three years uh, in basically crawling, extracting the content within apps, and we've done that for hundreds of, hundreds of apps, both in China as well as in the US, to understand the deep links, understand the context, and then kind of create them as what we call as deep view cards. So these cards are basically whether they're from Yahoo Finance, or they're from your favorite IMDB, like in terms of the movies, or your favorite restaurant from Yelp. We can extract that information create the content along with the actions and make them deep linkable. So when somebody taps on it, it'll either deep link to the right place and the right action within the app, or it'll take them to a mobile website or an app install store where they can install the app, right? So now, depending on the targeting and the interest and the location, these ads become a lot more contextual to where the user's at. And that increases the chances of people clicking on them and actually engaging with the app. So what we've seen is, for example, this is what we call as a deep view card which shows the content of an app, and you know, it has the content, it has the game, it has the price point, or when the event is happening, and a call to action to buy now. And what we are seeing is that when users interact with these types of ads, they tend to engage in higher click-through rates and higher conversion rates. So as an example, you know, what we are doing is taking these, uh, these are just different examples of cards with different calls to action, and what we are doing is presenting them in mobile display formats. They're also presented as search ads. So if somebody says hotels in New York City, we can show results from an Expedia or a TripAdvisor and then deep link them right into the app. Or through social ads. So these same cards can now be presented inside Facebook and Twitter. And we'll show you some examples of, or case studies from Twitter as well. So uh, for example, in this case, a uh, case study began with SeatGeek, which is a popular uh, events app, right, for sports and music concerts. We saw a 20% lift in click-through rate, but what blew us away was a 150% increase in conversions. Whether they were conversions due to uh, install events or people deep linking into the app to make the purchase. So much higher efficacy of these new types of app formats. Uh, similarly, when we ran these cards on Twitter, what we saw was that compared to the generic ads that show up on Twitter, when the ad was a lot more relevant to the user's location, to their interests, and showing dynamic content from within the apps and their favorite apps, we see that it was a much higher click-through rate, but a 264% increase in conversions. So you start to see these case studies that show the efficacy of, of uh, dynamic, uh, like content-rich content from apps. Uh, similarly, we ran a, a, a case study for a, a retailer in the US, and just it was a small like two-week test, but not only did we hit the right install numbers, but what we saw was the difference in purchase value, where the number of people purchasing content within the apps was a lot higher, right? Similarly, the install to purchase goals, because people are not caring not just about installs, they care about how many transactions are happening in their apps, right? Uh, and, and so we saw a much higher install to purchase rate, and um, logically then from there, the return on advertising spend was a lot more higher, and we were still meeting the, the cost per install goals, right? So these are just different case studies that show you the efficacy of the results from apps that are specifically targeted to marketers or product managers who are looking at different ways to grow their app audience, right, and also re-engage back with them. Uh, so how, does, uh, how are these DPU cards available in the market? Uh, what we do is we extract the content from within apps, uh, we build these cards, then we partner with ad tech companies, agencies, whether it's like Opera Media Works, or some of the other uh, partners. And once we've built out these cards, they're then available to publishers and eventually to consumers. So we just started to go to market its uh, first three months, but some of the results we're seeing are really interesting and, and exciting for us as to where we think the app engagement market can go. So that's pretty much it. I hope you had a, a good session and you know learned a little bit more about uh, what's happening in the app install game. How do you go beyond the install to focus on engagements, focus on transactions, what are some of the social and some of the ad advertising giants doing around deep linking and app engagement, and then some of the case studies that show the, the value of these deep view cards that are coming out in the market. That's it. Thank you so much.
Um, let's start. Um, we'll, we'll do intros. So, Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Chris Bronzo, the general manager of Agile the Opportunity Works here in San Francisco. Um, so, it's primarily on performance downloads, uh, but we also work in, um, in the brain space as well. Hey guys, uh, my name is Deng Kai Chen. I'm a director of product management here at Yahoo. Um, I lead uh, the native side of our Gemini business, which includes uh, our mobile um, as well as all our app marketing related products. My name is Tim Bolanova. I'm a head of media partnerships at Fetch, which is a full service mobile ad agency uh, based in San Francisco here. Uh, we represent clients like Uber, Apple, and the Expedia Group. Hi, I'm Deepak. I'm VP of Bond Position at Quixi. No, I just met me, so I won't say that. <laughs> so, so this reminds me of one of my very first meetups that I was doing when I was in Seattle. And we had a guy club from LA from Moby TV, and, uh, and he forgot his laptop charger at the hotel. And so we did a whiteboard session with 300 people in the room. <laughs> that, was more, that was pretty interesting. <laughs> Whiteboarding and sketching the architecture and business model and everything. It's kind of cool. But um, so I, let's start off with ad spend. So how many people here read eMarketer, love the eMarketer newsletters, right? Good data. So eMarketer says 2016, $100 billion of ad spend will be focused on mobile. This is awesome. So um, but where's all that money going? How many people are in the ad tech industry, by the way, ad tech? We're like, where the hell is that money coming from, right? So um, let's ask the panel. Like, where where are you seeing this? What is where is that hundred million dollars going? Hopefully, a lot is going out. <laughs> <laughs> not, not enough yet. But uh, so um, talking to our to our clients, you know, about sixty percent of that spend, and we're looking at financial as well, is going to Facebook and Google. Um, that still leaves quite a bit of money for the rest of us uh, to fight for um, in, in that space. So um, really, I think what we're seeing is a uh, vast majority going there primarily for targeting purposes for the first party uh, piece. Um, but there are still there's still a healthy business for um, for other formats, other ad tech companies, both existing and, and emerging to uh, to battle over that at 40, 45 million dollars, 45 million dollars. Yeah, I mean I think you know it's right. Google and Facebook take up about half the market. You know, if you want search um, you know, there's only a couple players with, with in town. Um, I think we're definitely seeing the transition from display advertising moving towards the more immersive formats like native, like video. Um, you know, we're starting to see MRAID and other types of more, you know, immersive formats once again come to fruition. So I think that plus a lot of deep linking stuff that Deepak talked about earlier will only kind of continue to drive the engagement. Because people always say, well, mobile doesn't perform as well as desktop, you know, and why is that? And I think People say, well, my canvas is so small, the screen is so small, but I think as devices get bigger and better, then, you know, the things you can do as a marketer will only increase over time. Yeah, I would say it's uh, it's quite fragmented still. Um, I think everyone talks about Facebook as being the big elf in the room where all the dogs are going, but, um, you know, I have to agree with, if anyone saw the, the talk by the Machine Zone CEO uh, uh, a few weeks ago about how Really, we can't all, as, as an industry, kind of put all our dollars in one publisher or one platform. That has to be a diversification in order to keep our uh, rates honest and, and, and get the value back to our clients and to our to our businesses. So we're continuing to look for new ad tech and new new partners, media partners in the space, knowing that you know, there's six billion devices out there, and not everyone's going to have one solution to, to reach them all in the right way for the right customer. So I think if you look at that e-marketer report which Mario mentioned, right, what you'll start to see is that of the money being spent in mobile, about like half of it is going into like search and like display, and then there's some social, primarily going to Facebook, but that's the one that's increasing rapidly. And then uh, there's a lot of money which is moving from desktop into mobile, right? And if you look at all the big brand marketers, these are the guys who are spending a lot of money, right? And traditionally where they've spent on desktop, that money is going away into mobile. The money spent on TV is remaining pretty much flat, right? So they still believe in the efficacy of linear, linear TV. But you're seeing that their spend on mobile is increasing pretty dramatically. And the next thing you might ask is that why is display advertising increasing? And the interesting thing in that report, it shows you is that the, the rate at which display is increasing is much more rapid than search. You might ask why. It's because on mobile the behavior is different. 
whether you are social or you're like browsing, browsing is a much bigger factor as opposed to like searching. Think about how many times you're searching on your mobile phone as opposed to just browsing or like checking out Facebook, right? So I think for app marketers or whether it's just marketers in general, brand or performance driven, the key is that you have to figure out a way to reach the audience at where they are at, right? The second thing I would say is the growth of programmatic display advertising, right? So programmatic has opened up this vast inventory of advertising sources, whether it's on publishers, whether it's on native inventory, and by giving this kind of a programmatic way, you're seeing a lot of buyers getting into the, the display advertising space. So um, I want to kind of fall back on what Tim, Tim was alluding on in, on the social side. So, so if I'm a if I'm an acquisition um, uh, marketing person, what am I missing out if I just focus on social media for acquisition? Is there it, it's working for me? It, but is there more to? Is there a bigger world out there? And and why should I care? Kind of thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I think Facebook and Twitter and all these other social platforms are easy ways to get started, and I think they provide the tools so that you can just get in there yourself and start playing around and run a campaign for a small business uh, and that opportunity to scale it to have the audience there but um, I think like Deepak said is also there's different behaviors that we have to look at not just social data and not just social browsing behavior because that's one set and it only tells one aspect of how users behave and you know there's search signals there's uh, location signals and all these other things that we should be looking at to really find the users in the right context, but also in the right mindset and the right intent. So we're looking at all these different channels and whatever that is, we're trying to access exactly what you said, like programmatically. So getting that those data signals, reaching those audiences in real time um, and in, in a way that we can go direct to the source uh, as an agency and as a, a, a representing our clients. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously if you look at where users spend time on your phone. Obviously, there's a ton of time spent in social, but if you look at the categories where users spend the most amount of time, it's actually gaming, and then it's probably messaging as the second vertical. So I think if you want to capture more audience, if you want that reach and frequency across the day, you have to buy outside of social. And then, you know, you know um, the earlier speaker, if I'm blanking your name, sorry. Tim, Tim, Tim was alluding to earlier. Um, you know, the context is actually very powerful when you show your marketing message, show your ad. So, you know, there's a lot of things that just don't work. When you when I'm browsing through Facebook, I might not be thinking about, hey, what are the new games I want to check out? Or, you know, I'm not in the shopping mode when I'm browsing through my Facebook feed or Instagram feed. But later, when I am playing a game, when I am shopping online or something like that, I might be more receptive to specific advertisements at that time. Yeah, yeah so if I'm a video advertiser, where am I? Is social the big place to cook for consumption or acquisition, or where do I go? Okay, so it's certainly a big one. I, I think just to add to what these guys already said, so people are spending about a third of their time on, on social media, so on Facebook and Twitter. So basically, if you're only advertising on that on those those platforms, you're missing two thirds of their time. So you're missing the vast majority of the time they're spending on their mobile devices. So um, so we talked about time spent on social, but we also talked about data. The beautiful thing about acquisition marketing is we have data. So you can test all these different channels, you can test different mediums, uh, and determine what's working for you. Um, some users choose to um, engage on a, on a social platform and are willing to download an app and even open an app and play an app. From there, many are just going through, they're spending their five or 10 minutes and they're going off to the next thing. And that's not the platform that they use to consume additional content or to go outside of that experience, um, even for a short time. So um, so, I, I, so I guess the, the, the advice here is, um, there's a lot of really viable alternatives for you out there. It doesn't cost a lot of money to test many of those alternatives. So it, um, the, the, the advice here is go test, use data, data's your friend, uh, and then determine uh, how your budget should be uh, allocated appropriately. Cool, so let, let's talk about strategy. So I'm, I'm an acquisition manager, and there's I can be in three different houses, right? I, the one house is, uh, it's all organic. Hey, I never spend, I just want to be pure organic and that's, I get the best users that way. And there's another wheelhouse, like a lot of gamers, it's all, in the, by the run, I run my business by the numbers, meaning forget organic, it's I, I, I buy my users and it's there's a formula that I use and it's all run by the numbers. And then there's a kind of like a mix in between. Some organic, some paid. And what, 
what are the strategies that you've seen? I mean, I know definitely it's, it depends on the case, but which one works the best, right? Uh, if, if there was a, an acquisition manager out there that was maybe even emerging and starting, where, where would I spend my time? So I come from obviously the paid acquisition space. I'll be the first to tell you, if you can acquire all your users organically, you should acquire them all organically. Because <laughs> um, obviously it doesn't cost you any money. I, but the reality is I haven't seen a strategy where you can really, a effective strategy where you can only acquire users organically. There's just way too many apps on the stores. Um, discovery is probably the biggest challenge for all of, all of you folks in the acquisition business. And, and so really what it comes down to is it, it's a mix. So you have to be able to use paid acquisition to fuel rankings, to fuel organics, to fuel viral downloads, or to supplement those downloads. Um, and every, it seems like every developer, acquisition person has a different algorithm for how they attribute organics based on paid. Um, whatever that formula is that works for you, um, that's, that's fine. Uh, but I don't think there is um, an only organic strategy. And while, and you also have to balance your budgets um, and where you are um, within your, your, your timelines, um, your goals, to determine whether you're going to compete with the mega spenders and when you're going to compete with them. Are you going to go to battle with the top three developers in the world for Christmas? Or are you going to choose to wait until January or February to better allocate those dollars to new devices that are that have just been sold at the lower cost of acquisition? So really, it's about understanding um, the market dynamics, who's, who's playing, when they're playing, and when is your opportunity um, to maximize your dollars. I mean, a lot, I think a lot of people have said data is your best friend, and it really is. Um, you know, there isn't a single acquisition strategy that works for people, whether it's referral, paid, organic, whatever, you know, whatnot. You know, and it, it always surprises me the number of people that I see buying and spending lots of money who don't have good attribution in place, who don't have a good analytics solution in place. And it's so easy to get started to do small test buys. It really is, you know, make it scientific, whether you're gaming or not. You know, make sure you're instrumented correctly. Start doing your test buy. Start, you know, trying your, you know, your viral email campaigns or other acquisition channels, and see what performs. See what leads to higher user retention. See what leads to more LTV. And once you start to figure that out, you have a much more focused strategy for how you do user acquisition. Yeah, as an agency, we've built our business on paid marketing, but we're having more conversations with the client to say like. You know, in a nice way, your app sucks. We're not going to invest paid marketing until you know we help fix your app, and we're not going to just grow a, a, a you know something that's that's you know a user base that's not going to monetize, it's not going to stick around. So we've uh, you know had to change our offerings a bit and become more of a, a strategic consultant along our uh, clients, helping them think about UX and UI design, helping them think about monetization, app store optimization. You know, if you have three stars or less in the app store, you should probably should best in paid marketing. You know, if you're you're losing a lot of users just at the landing page is what we tell our, our clients. So it's it's you know it's hard for us to say no to you know media dollars, but I think it's in the client's best interest at the end of the day uh, to have a great app experience and a great uh, organic uh, experience before they even invest a dollar in paid marketing. Yep. I think I agree with what, what all these gentlemen said, but I would, I would nuance my answer by like when I think about app developers, right, and there's like a million plus in each of like the Apple Store and Google Store, 80% of them make less than like $1,000 a month, right, from each of these apps. So paid app marketing may not always be the path for them. But you have to nuance it and say, okay, which segment are you? If you're a startup app developer, you probably want to maximize how you can get through organic acquisition. And there are a number of channels to do that, like just, you know, App search optimization to make sure that app store optimization to make sure that you show up consistently at the top of these results when people are searching for your category, or make sure that you have a good video, a good app description, getting good reviews, right? So those are all important things. Make sure that you can send posts into Facebook or Twitter or Instagram so you build up your loyal fan followers who then kind of spread the message. Those are all good acquisition methods. As you start to grow bigger, it starts to make more and more sense for you to do user acquisition, paid acquisition on top of the organic acquisition. And what you'll see is that they both have a synergistic effect. Sometimes when people see your ad, they may not click on it, but when they go to the app store or they're like somewhere else, they remember they want to install that app, or they, they, there's some brand recall. So all of these things come together. So what I would say is 
you have to use a mix of both, not just any one of them, when you're trying to do holistic uh, acquisition strategy. Cool. So let's talk about ad units and but first, let's start with native advertising. We really know what native advertising is about. Okay. Well, can someone on the panel describe what native advertising is and why should they? I think and, I should and, 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 and tell them, and then why should they care? As someone who's doubled down on native advertising, or works at a company that has doubled down on native advertising, I do have a vested interest in this. So take it with a grain of salt. So. Our definition of native advertising is where the ad presentation fits the format of its surrounding organic content. So for example, if you look at our ad units on Tumblr versus what we have in Yahoo Weather versus what we have on Yahoo Search, it all differs according to um, you know, the stream, the feed, the article that it's in. And we do this for a couple reasons. First off is you know, our operating assumption is that you know, the, that old 300 by 250 banner, it, 300 by 50 banner, it just sucks. And people have become, become what I call banner blind. They just instinctively know at the top of the page or the bottom of the page, they just ignore whatever's there. When they open the app, you know, they, they're going to get an interstitial, so they know exactly where to hit the X out, and they just ignore it and move on. So when you're, you know, browsing through a feed and you're starting to consume your content, your brain is, you know, it's like, okay, I know there's a headline, there's a description, there's an image, and that's how I'm processing the information. So we've seen for mobile and, you know, even on desktop, when you shift from display to native, your user engagement goes up, your click-through rates go up, and your overall performance goes up. So, you know, we as a company have invested heavily in it, and I think even um, across other networks, across other publishers, you're starting to see more and more people go native for the specific reason. Cool. All right. So um, let's and let's, let's go beyond the native ads. Let's look at other. What are the other ad units? And I love I talked about beyond the banner um, on the native side. But what ad units are working for folks? We can start down. I know. Start down the line and say like what what's working for people and. Yeah. Um, I know you're in you know, the video. So, so I mean, so we can obviously I can't do it as a video only uh, platform, but of course, opera display. We have other systems as well. So. Um, what I will say is that uh, we do a survey a couple times a year with all of our clients, um, and we're seeing that there are really three major display units that they would speak to. So social is probably number one, two, um, which is a, which is by nature kind of a native ad unit, right? Uh, number two is video, uh, and the third one, display is still alive, so display seems to be the, the, the third biggest format. When you get beyond those three formats, it really gets low and slow at the bottom. So those are the dominant ones that are out there um, that we see from the top advertisers in the space. So, so um, question is, what, what happened to rich media? And why, why although it, it looks beautiful, why, why don't we see more of it in that industry? What is it? Is it the networks? Is it because they're not standard formats? What is the, what is, what is the issue about rich media? I mean, I think it's, it's available. We just don't see it very often. I think it's, um, I think the whole ecosystem is, you know, it's it's difficult, right, to to for an agency or a client to develop rich media well. Um, I think there's you know issues with assets, uh, with uh, you know the creative development production of that, and if I have the right tools, um, and then just costs, right, at the end of the day. But uh, I, I I don't say I think we're still, you know, as an agency trying to push our clients to do more innovative, creative. Things there's you know Facebook's coming out came out with Canvas and Google has their own HTML5 thing and Quixi and all these guys have their own more immersive richer unit and I think that's where we want to get to is is, is again make ads less ads and more like content and more things that look and feel like the things we actually want to consume and enjoy and closer to what we uh, want to get to at the end of the destination so um, I think. It's not dead, it's not going away, I think it's there, it's just um, it, it, certain clients have to be savvy enough and they have the entire ecosystem and infrastructure to, to deliver on that. I would say like, you know, what you see emerging in ad formats is a direct influence of what consumers demand, right? So if you look at the millennials, they're a lot more about engaging with content and, engage, and if you show them something that explicitly stands out as an ad, it's like what Kai mentioned, there's a <coughs> banner blindness and you don't want to click on it. If however you show me something that's relevant and it's you know much more in line with the content that I'm reading about, aka when you think of Facebook ads, they're absolutely in line. They're the first pioneers of native ads 
showing you something that will show up once you've read through like five or six newsfeed posts. Here's a newsfeed post which is very much catered to your interest segments, to your location, to your needs. You're more likely to engage with it, right? So it's more about showing you engaging formats that fit in with the overall story and advertisers and ad platforms are responding to that need to be much more adaptive in what type of formats that they show to people. Um, so let's talk about something new in the news lately has been um, ad blockers. How many people here have an ad blocker installed on their phone? Wow. Do you, you notice it? <laughs> so, okay, here's another question. How many people in this room have clicked in the last week on an ad? On purpose? <laughs> wow. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so and that's how we make money, Mario. So, <laughs> I was like, no, so it does. It does represent a small percentage of no, <laughs> just like, so. Um, okay, so no, because I was at a conference a while, well, a couple months ago, and like I think half the room said yes, I did, and I asked, okay, yeah, but on purpose, and half their hands went down. Um, but let's talk about ad blockers. I mean, it's, it's, is it impacting us? I mean, is it impacting the industry? I know, um, you know, a lot of. I mean, this room is very special because of we're early adopters, but what, are, are, ad, are ad blockers impacting our business? It... I think it will, right? I think uh, what we are seeing is again a consumer reaction to having too many ads. Uh, if you look at the IAB standards, for example, like native ads are not getting so Im impacted by ad blockers the way regular banner ads are, right? And I think it's very important that people understand that there's a value exchange going on. When a news publisher is putting out ads, that's the only way it makes money for showing you quality content, right? And so we have to, as consumers, also understand that that you know I, I think there needs to be a better job being done across the ecosystem to say that when an ad is shown, right, we need to make sure that you are seeing this ad because you are getting a lot of free content, right? And we let people make that decision. Also, I think it's very important as an industry we focus more on those native ads, focus on making it more contextual to what you need, right? And at the end of the day, the consumer is going to make the choice. If we're showing you these kind of ads that you don't want to see, yes, ad blocking will become more and more prevalent. Yeah. I think the onus is actually on us up here as ad tech providers to make ads relevant and not suck. Because I think, at least on the mobile side of the house, like there are relevant reasons for having an ad blocker. Like It's draining your data plan, it can drain your battery if it's poorly implemented. A lot of publishers just don't know how to integrate ads into their apps or mobile web experiences. So if you look at desktop where you know ad blocking definitely does impact the industry, like it's kind of we need to fix this now, otherwise everyone will install ad blockers and you know if if, if we follow that path, it's gonna be you know a pretty big hurt on everyone's business. So basically, I mean the ad blockers are basically come out of the, the, the experiences that we that we're getting already. <coughs> Untargeted, like why? Why would I want feminist products or targeted to me? Yeah. Or there's a mismatch on the targeting, or um, it's yeah irrelevant, right? It yeah. gets annoying. Like, I agree. Or I love these uh, uh, ad walls and things like that. Just, you know, <laughs> websites from like you know, emerging markets and stuff. Um, but um, okay, so ad blockers, uh, shame on us, right? <laughs> um, let's look at audiences. So we have an audience here, and so uh, for my particular brand, I'm a buyer, and I, how do I go pick my audiences? You know, where, where do I do research? Do you guys help me? You know, and when I buy my ads, like, hey, you know, I'm Snapchat. Should I be targeting, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know retired folks and things like that? Right? Or, how, how does that go about? You know, how do you? I don't, you know, Facebook, Twitter. You can go there and pick like, I want 18 to 25, and it's kind of a little Chinese menu kind of thing, right? But, how, how, how do I do that? You know, where do I start when I start targeting? Yeah. I, well, I think the first thing is to think less about audiences from like a demographic perspective and more about sort of outcomes and results that, that, that you're looking for. That's the audience you want, right? You don't really care whether it's a male or female or what their age is. They engage with the app and they spend money. They're your users. So that's that's your audience. It's not male or female. It's not, it's not demographic driven. Uh, I just read something today uh, where the VP of Netflix said that age and sex are irrelevant to the entire Netflix targeting model. Um, they're looking for people who are watching similar types of shows and they're cohorting those people together and they're looking at very specific actions and outcomes. 
And that's the way we should be looking at our, at, at our business as well. Um, that's, that's, that's maybe the first part. The second part is, is that um, I, never like to put, I never like to introduce human um, presumption about what the audience is, particularly with an app that hasn't been out yet or any content that hasn't been available to the users. So you may think that this app that you made for um, 18 to 25 year old women is your, is your audience. And then after having that app in the ecosystem, you quickly find out that it's 40 to 50 year old men who are actually consuming the content, right? So, so what, we, what, what I always recommend is we spend a lot of money, time, and energy and have a lot of smart people working on the ad tech serving. Um, and finding those audiences for you, let us tell you which who, who your audience is, and then we can start grouping uh, inventory sites together and bidding on them appropriately uh, once we understand exactly what the demographic is. So take the human the human element out of it. You know that probably hurts a lot of marketers' feelings. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's, it's the data um, that we can provide you um, that is really sort of your best source for, for targeting. I would actually agree with that 100%. It's really funny because I work with both performance advertisers, which is probably much more like this crowd, as well as like, you know, the PNGs and Unilevers of the world. And the PNGs are like, I know my demo, please give me that demo. And we'll say, but no, like you're missing out on all this other stuff. And they're like, I don't care, I want my segment. And I think that's a really poor way to think about it. So I think, you know, there's explicit targeting, you know, Mario's Chinese menu. I think there's the implicit targeting that all of us do behind the scenes of the signals we look at from your ad performance data to try to find the best user. But really at the end of the day, you had the best data. And this is why I think like you guys bring your first party data to us, to Facebook, to whomever. And you know, you know, the network's doing look like modeling audience expansion. That's actually the best tap because that is a concrete signal from the marketer or developer that says, hey, I have 100,000 users, but these 10,000, these are the people I care about and I want. Tell me more about them and help me find more users. And at the end of the day, it actually just simplifies the whole buying experience if you can get it to work. I would say that you know, everything that they mentioned, but just to add on to that, what you're seeing is the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And Advertising and ad tech is a big consumer of that big data machine learning. And the reason why this is happening is it's like completely unsupervised machine learning models that are exactly able to understand which user clicked on that ad, what was their demographic, and then just double down and double down and optimize the heck out of that ad until you start seeing the install rates and the conversion rates. Some of those case studies that we showed you is all because of these kind of machine learning models. And as much as you guys may not like it, machines are going to automate everything that a lot of us humans do and ad tech is kind of at the forefront of it. So you'll get to see more of these where the audience segment or choosing that doesn't matter, let the machines do that job. They are anyways a lot better than us trying to predict what audience is gonna click or install an app. So, um, so but you mentioned something kind of interesting. Okay, so traditional advertising models were, it was all box demos and groups of people, hey, 19 to 25 year old males, uh, hipsters in the mission district, you know, stuff like that, right? Um, and, and I think that those are like legacy, like legacy profiling techniques, right? Yes. So then, so let's 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 talk about identity, and then um, how are we starting to identify our users and tracking them? And you know, because it's it's difficult to to then maybe put them in the cohorts or look at activity and just start to group like. How do I group all the people that watch Star Trek and all the sci-fi stuff on Netflix? How do I group them? You know, regardless of age, right? Right. Um, how do I go about? How do we go about this on, on mobile? Because it's it's it, the fragmentation. I love fragmentation because one, it, it gives us jobs. It probably employs half of us in this room. But then the other side of it, fragmentation, also makes our jobs very very difficult, right? And I just want to get your takes on how how are we working on identity. And specifically, device identity, and then are there is the industry moving? To, can we find a way where identity is cross platform <coughs> TV, web, mobile, car, right? You know, definitely, I think, I think five years from now we will be having an interesting conversation about automotive and and, and, and ad advertising interaction in the, in the car. But we're not there yet. But what do you guys see that on the identity side? So maybe I'll start with the second part first, which is the cost of life. Yes. Very, very difficult. So let's say you have a commercial login or Facebook, Twitter, something like that. It's really, really hard to track users from desktop to mobile, uh, to, to, to mobile 
mobile web. <coughs> um, so that's the challenge. That's, I don't think we're quite there yet. What I think most advertisers are doing, and what we see is that they're they're really just tracking them within those silos. They're not they're not able to make the crossover just just yet. And so in, in many cases, there's even different buying teams, there's different marketing teams, etc. Each handling those um, those devices, those, those mediums. Um, so tracking them across the device, I think, is, is we're not there yet. Um, uh, that's certainly I think the ambition. Uh, but in the meantime, what we do is you know we're we're mostly in ad. You know, at ad um, so we can track we, we can track that user's IDFA actions, and we can do look like modeling, uh, and some segment targeting, just using the activities that we know they've done within our network. We know what ads that they've seen, what ads they've clicked on, what ads they've downloaded, and then we're able to to do look like modeling based on just that activity within our network within um, mobile apps. Yeah, I, w I guess this is where we're probably at a little bit more of a data advantage. Um, I like to say like our data and targeting teams, they're, they, 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 they're stitching together this huge quilt because we do have universal login. Um, so and uh, quite a few people log in um, across mobile and desktop. So we do can do cross conversion. And Tumblr like Yeah, Tumblr. Tumblr. So I mean, if you look at you know Yahoo, Tumblr, um, we have all the flurry data. We have all the search data, mail data. There's a lot of signals that we have in there. And, and we have like 50 data partnerships with the Axioms and you know Nielsen's and American Expresses in the world as well. So, but I think the challenge here is doing it in a very privacy-safe manner and making sure that consumers have opt-out. They know what's being tracked, what's not being tracked. Um, and obviously, when it comes to your personal device, that's where the creepy factor kicks in. So I think. Be, being able to, you know, do the user reset, you know, and I'm glad Apple and Google have moved from UDID to the, the settable um, um, device IDs of the world. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's like identity is becomes the number one thing because if you talk about marketers, especially traditional guys, it's reach and frequency. And you know, we just did a study um, earlier where basically, if you look at millennials and Generation X, it's like. When they're watching primetime TV, they're switching devices more than 10 times an hour. You know, they're on their laptop, they're on their phone, they're streaming Netflix. So if you want to reach the same person and make sure you have this progression, message, it's like you have to be able to do cross device at some point. I think there are two factors that are going to contribute to enabling kind of better tracking across screens. It's going to be like ad serving, the like universal ad serving across. Uh, platforms and it's going to be the rise of the DMP, which is a lot of our clients are asking about. So, you know, ad serving, I know it's it's kind of fragmented and you've got desktop ad servers and you've got mobile and some are good at cookies and some are just good at the device ID game. And I, I would love for our industry to push forward in the mobile side to actually implement third party ad serving. I think it's good for the entire industry in mobile. You know, we'll actually, buyers will be happy to see and, and have better control over where their ads are running and then you know, the vendors will actually get paid for views and and all the all the all the great value that comes from from people who you're exposed to ads. We know that has an impact on brand. So um, I think that is something that needs to happen. We're pushing for um, this year and this and then DMPs or data management platforms. Um, a lot of our clients and what we're kind of investing in is how do we you know there are companies now specific to mobile who are trying to tie this you know the cookie based system and web uh, of Know, kind of the IDs and, and uh, that are on mobile devices and translating those two things and helping you know you segment your users and, and apply it to different things. So I think that's that's going to be exciting space to watch. Yeah, I think a lot of investment is being made in this cross device targeting by basically building device creds of like knowing who you are. If it's Joe who's watching, who's checking out his desktop computer based on this IP address, this Wi-Fi, then checks out their iPhone, then goes onto the Apple Watch. It's a marketer's delight that depending on what time of the day it is and where you happen to be on TV or desktop or mobile, how can I target you and give you the same ad but like not make it overwhelming? So there's a lot of uh, research, a lot of activity going on in what is called is this probabilistic uh, learning model, right? Which says probabilistically, can I understand that it's the same person and then start to target ads to that, you know, as the person carries on the journey across different devices. So as everything goes digital, and Mario talked at the beginning about IoT, I think that's going to explode even more. And there's some interesting work being done by like companies like Drawbridge, uh, which are starting to really get a lot more information about this device graph. And you see, every day I'm approached by different companies saying, I'd love to pay for your data. Like, if I can just get hashed email addresses and device, 
from a consumer perspective, it's very creepy, right? How much data invasion is happening about what you do and where you do it. But that's the sad reality. It, it, advertising works on that basis. That's how people are making well, that's money. Well, that's why we get free services, right? Yeah. You don't have to pay. Well, you have but to pay um, for that. But I'll, get, I'll get to you right now. Um, so, so I, I want to ask the panel is, why, why doesn't the industry build a centralized repository that is oh, accessible by everyone in the industry on, I, I, on some type of identity? So that I would go and so all my devices, my web, you know, my car, it's all like, yeah, this is Mario and he's opted in to, hey, he, he wants these kind of car ads and, and sports and things like that. Why, why does the industry build something like that? Because it's, it's, it's a secret sauce, right? So I mean, I, my personal perspective on this is like, if you're a network, you have access to supply and to demand, and you know, my, the advertisers that buy with us probably buy with all these guys. Some of our publishers are publishers for you know the other networks as well. So at the end of the day, to me, what the sustainable long-term advantage is is data. Being able to find the right user to show the right ad to that that's will actually value. convert. That's the value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this uh, area, the creepy factor. You expect legislation either here or in Europe. Privacy legislation to kind of prove all this. So, all this? so the question is, uh, do you think uh, legislation and policy is going to in, in here in U.S. and Europe is going to impact um, this identity <coughs> following? I think you're already seeing that in Europe, right, with yeah. the forget me policy, yeah. and I think they are right, much more at the forefront of protecting users' privacy. So, I expect U.S. will. My guess is that U.S. will start to put some legislation around this, and maybe even this repository of like a central like opt-out system. But I don't know, everybody has a very vested interest, the incumbents, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Google, to kind of have these privacy wall gardens of their own information. So it's going to take maybe a couple of startups to come in and say, how do we create or, this kind or of open, open source it? Open source it? I don't know. It's, it's, I think time will tell. It's very interesting. Nobody can quite know where this will go. I mean, I think it becomes incumbent. Like for us, it's like we do what Google and Apple allow us to do. They control the platforms, they control the stores. We all have to buy them by their developers, you know, terms of service and developer agreements. So I think that is kind of a, a foundational thing because that also leads to standardization. Like if for people who were working on iOS back when Apple banned UDID, it was like, it was like nuclear apocalypse, like everything <laughs> broke. And then there's open UDID, which you know a bunch of open source people try to create, and there's all these solutions. People are using MAC addresses and you know Bluetooth chip, you know, IMEI, all sorts of bad things. And then that's when Apple realized it's like, okay, there's a need for this, so we as a platform maker need to provide some sort of solution. So I think that's where the regulation will head towards, is how the governments will kind of regulate what Apple and Google are allowed to do. Um, I'd like to open up to questions. Anybody have questions on the audience? Anyone? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so right now, like people use like YouTube and Google to search for things, and most people consider like Facebook a discovery platform. Um, but how I see it is Facebook is also becoming more of a search platform, and most people would agree with me. And the reason for that is you have things like Canvas, uh, instant articles which I'm really hoping uh, someone can touch on here because I know that's a massive market. Um, the publication industry uh, in the entire world is 270 billion plus dollars. And Facebook just made a giant step in there. And when I talk to most millennials, they say that they get their news right from Facebook, which is, it's pretty funny, but I mean, that's what's happening. So what, what's the question? And the question is, you know, what are your opinions on instant articles? And because people are using Facebook more to search for information such as news. And using that as you know, ad revenue. Okay. So uh, the question is like, uh, Facebook has a new product called Instant Articles, and it has uh, with specific relationships with publishers. And maybe someone on the panel can explain Instant Articles and also see how they're how, how is that going to impact their business. Um, so Facebook Instant Articles and Google's equivalent, I think it's called AMP. It's basically where the click is pre-cached. So instead of hey, I'm on Facebook, there's an interesting BuzzFeed article, I click and it takes like eight seconds, 10 seconds, 12 seconds for the hit content to actually load. It's pre-cached and I click and my story is right there. So it's a fantastic user experience. Um, so my take on this, it's like, this is absolute future in some er an area where we're investing. So we all have, you know, our internal, you know, latency measurements and an ad that clicks out to a mobile 
landing page is a terrible experience. Even if you're on Wi-Fi, even if you're on a fast device, you know, you're talking about median latencies of like six to eight seconds. Like think about that. I click and I'm gonna wait six to eight seconds or longer for my content to load. So I think, you know, whether it's for organic content or for some sort of ad landing experience, you know, users are busy. We have to get the content or the ad to load instantly. So I absolutely think that's the future. Yeah, I think it's a great move for content. I think that's where we need to be. Is I just worry about how, you know how really the internet, as it was intended to be, which is agnostic and a free access to everything, is now being controlled by a few. You know, and what we what we see in here is is dictated by algorithms, and that's a whole other philosophy around that. But um, I say it's overall a good thing. I think it's it's interesting also what Snapchat's doing in terms of content. Uh, we're watching that closely and just how users are now and brands are going in to see updated content daily and it's a, it's a beautiful, easy experience. So everyone's racing to have the content distributed in the right way to the users in, in like um, in just a seamless way. So I think it's, it's going to be a, a battle for that type of content. And then video is just going to be you know, where everyone's going to be now just watching little bits of video. Um, news and content throughout the uh, channel. So. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Hey, hi. Uh, let's say I'm an advertiser and I'm trying to get more users and I uh, send buy ads with you guys and I see like when users click on it between the time they click and then go to App Store and then download and then actually log into the app. It's kind of like 80% drop between that point to that point. What are you guys doing to address that? Um, because that, all that clicks is going to go waste I think there's some new innovative formats that will start to come out, especially around app engagement where, you know, can a user get the results they want from an app or a mobile website without necessarily having to go visit it, right? So like concepts like app streaming where users can like play the game or look at the news or go transact and buy a dress that they see on an e-commerce app right from the unit itself is something we'll start to see, right? We're also seeing things like Apple Pay integrating directly to Safari where you can buy a product right from there using Apple Pay. So a lot of conversions will happen. Those who own the ecosystem or start to like put those components in to provide a more seamless action. All of this benefits the user, right? Because it takes the friction away and we'll continue to see a lot of innovation happen in this. Questions? Cool. Um, well, I'd like to thank, thank everyone, the panelists uh, here tonight. Um, also thank uh, Quixie and Yahoo for making this event possible. Give guys those girls guys a round of applause, please. So, um, thank you, Yahoo. <laughs> um, I guess the panelists will, will hang out for a while. You guys are free. welcome to, uh, we're here till nine. The doors lights out at nine. Feel free to mingle. We still have a lot more drinks left over. Thank you, guys.